Welcome back to our study of David uh, and pursuing the heart of God, which we're trying to do, and we're learning from David's life, his example, uh, situations that he faced, how he responded to God, how he responded to being in a cave that we talked about last week. Well, now we're going to move into 2 Samuel. We're going to speed up the time a little bit, and we're going to go to David's time as king. David has indeed become king over all of Israel. And so David was back, uh, but there were some things that still weren't in place yet. And so David is going to um, try to put some things in order, and one of those was the return of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant for the, for the uh, Jewish people, and certainly in that day, was very, very significant. The Ark was really the very center of their Christian experience, their religious life. Uh, and you can see a picture of it on the screen uh, of what it looked like. It was this, this big box, a golden box, uh, that was covered in gold. And you can see the, the poles on each side, the four rings, one in each corner. That becomes very significant in today's story in 2 Samuel chapter 6, where we will be looking uh, today. And so the, Israel had lost the uh, Ark of the Covenant. It had been taken by the infamous Philistines that were always causing trouble. And so uh, they had defeated Israel way, way back, and uh, they had taken the, the Ark. And if you remember that story from 1 Samuel chapter 4, uh, Eli was the priest. He had some sons that were pretty much good for nothing and, and not much help. Uh, and they had neglected the temple. They had neglected God. They neglected the people, uh, even as the priest, even as God's, God's people, God's men. Uh, and so they allowed the ark to be taken and stolen. Uh, well, in the process of events, they both all were, were, were killed, uh, Eli and his two sons. And one of them, uh, one of his son's uh, wives was about to have a baby. But the ark was gone. Israel was just in an absolute mess. And so, poor kid, he was born, and his mother named him Ichabod for whatever reason. Well, we know, because that means the glory has departed. Ichabod uh, was, was written over this part of Israel's history, that the glory of God had departed. And that was represented by the Ark of the Covenant. Now, we know the glory, the glory of God is much more than in a box, but this was in their Old Testament Jewish tradition and laws that this Ark was very, very central uh, to uh, what uh, Israel was and as they uh, practiced their religion and the confession of sins and, and the priest and all of that. So it's gone, and after all this time, David finally becomes king. He's settled in Jerusalem, and he says, I'm going to get that ark. He found out where it was, and they went, and they did indeed get it. And so when we pick up here in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel, they are returning the ark to Jerusalem. And that sounds great, doesn't it? The, the ark is being a return uh, to Jerusalem. But the ark was a pretty heavy, heavy piece, <laughs> pretty heavy piece of furniture, so to speak. Uh, and so uh, we're going to find out that they made some critical mistakes. We all want to experience the glory of God. We want, we want to know God's glory and see God's glory, and we see it in so many ways. We see it, uh, uh, you know, in landscaping. We see beautiful mountains or beautiful sunset and uh, whatever the case may be, whatever uh, we particularly care for. We can say, man, I could just see the glory of God in that sunset or in that, that scene. Uh, uh, mine might be uh, on a porch in the mountains uh, sitting in a rocking chair. I can, I can experience a lot of God's glory right there. Uh, and so yours may be some, somewhere else. And I'm not talking about us just having fun. I'm talking about truly experiencing and seeing and witnessing the glory of God. We may see it in our lives. We may see it in our homes when a newborn baby comes and, and that baby is, is born and we just see the glory and experience the glory of God or when something great and significant happens uh, in church, a, a moving, wonderful worship story, I, I just felt the glory of God. Well, for Israel, it was Ichabod. The glory had departed because the ark had departed. And so David was going to try to bring it back. Well, they're making their, their way along. And what we're going to look at is uh, three primary ways we can miss God's glory. So we're entitling this, Don't Miss the Glory. 
Don't let Ichabod be written on your epitaph. Don't let that be written on your back or, what, or more importantly, on your heart. And so uh, they made some mistakes that caused some of them to miss the glory of God and could cause us as well. And the first of those uh, is uh, they were practicing uh, convenient Christianity. They were practicing convenient Christianity. So when we pick up in chapter 6, David had gathered all the men together and they went up and got that thing uh, to bring the ark, uh, which, is called, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned. And look at verse 3. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and uh, Ahiah, the sons of Abinadab, they were driving the new cart. So they had the ark on a cart, which sounds very, makes sense to us, but that, that thing's heavy. It's, it's, it's solid gold. It's gold. It's not solid gold. It had an inside. Some things were in, uh, inside the ark to represent and remind them of, of, of God's glory and his presence and his provision. Uh, so that thing was heavy. So it made sense. Hey, let's, let's put this thing on a cart and roll it across to Jerusalem. They were going through rocks and deserts and hills and mountains and valleys and streams and everything else probably to get to Jerusalem and say, hey, let's put it on ark, except for one problem. That's not how God told the, them the ark was to be used. Remember, God, the ark represents God for them. Uh, God's presence, God's glory, God's holiness. And so they settled for a convenient Christianity. Their instructions in the Old Testament had been uh, put those two rods, those two poles that we saw uh, on the, the picture of the ark through those rings and is to be carried by four men, a certain four men of the priestly tribe. And so that's how it was supposed to be transported, not on an ark, uh, not on a cart, excuse me. I get my arcs and my carts mixed up sometimes, uh, but not on a cart. They were to carry it by foot. They were never to touch it, which we're going to see is very significant. And so they were instructed never to actually touch the ark. And then, of course, when it was at home, it would be in the tabernacle, which is all they still had uh, then. And uh, they, were, they were moving toward uh, getting a temple, but they didn't have a permanent temple yet. David wanted one. That's another story uh, that we're covering. Uh, but the uh, ark um, was, was to sit in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and eventually the, the temple. It was very holy. It represented the holiness of God. And so uh, it was treated in a very convenient, convenient manner. Two things happened by getting that cart for the ark. And that was, first of all, disobedience for the laws of God. God had said, do not do it that way. Don't do it that way. And then the second, um, disrespect for the, the things of God. It was holy. Treat it with respect. Treat the holy things of God with respect. Treat the, the holy things uh, associated with God, things God has established. That includes the body of Christ. The body of Christ should be treated with much respect because we, we are indeed the body, the bride of Christ. Uh, it means our personal relationships, particularly our marriage relationships and, and our, our children or our parents. Uh, those relationships are holy because God established them, certainly with our husband or our wife. And so uh, if, we, if we treat that with convenience, uh, we're going to miss some of the glory that God in, intended. But those are holy things that we should revere and protect. And so Israel was not uh, doing that. But remember, God never promised that Christianity would be convenient. He never said that. Matter of fact, the Bible says, look, the, the Bible speaks of, of wars. The Bible speaks of uh, we wrestle uh, not against flesh and blood. We fought, Paul, Paul said, I fought the good fight. I have finished my course. Uh, the Bible talks about a battle, that we're in a battle. The Christian life is a battle. In Ephesians, he gives us weapons of spiritual warfare to fight that battle, spiritual battles now. Uh, and so he never says anywhere that it's going to be easy. He never says anywhere in his word that it's going to be convenient. And so you, you choose convenience over respecting God and, and who he is 
Uh, and that includes things like the church, things like our marriages, and, and so many other areas of our lives that are holy. They're to be set apart. And so we're to revere them. Um, and then the, the second thing uh, that, that caused uh, them to, to lose the glory, or at least some of them, certainly one in particular, is not only convenient Christianity, but casual Christianity. As they're carrying that ark on the cart, it was bad enough they were on the cart, but then something happens. And look in verse uh, 6 in, here in chapter 6. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah, who's one of the guys that was minding the cart, he took hold of it, the ark, he took hold of it to, to steady it. Uh, he, he thought that would be uh, good out. He, he put out his hand to the ark and took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. Well, verse 7 says the anger of the Lord was great, and he struck Uzzah down right there on the spot. We might say that seems a little severe. He was just trying to save things, keep the thing from falling. So, you know, he had tried to steady it with his hand, just a natural impulse. But when sometimes God's not interested in our natural impulses. He's interested in us obeying uh, his word, and he has, had said a hand, a human hand, is not to touch. It is not to be touched. And so Uzzah paid a, a very high price for treating the things of God, the ark, in a casual manner. Uh, and so he, he, he learned that the hard way, you could say, and then it was too late. Uh, that we sometimes can can get involved and be guilty of casual Christianity. Now, we probably would never all decide what constitutes casual and what doesn't and what constitutes reverence. And some would say, well, what's casual to you is reverence to me. Well, that, we have to be careful with that attitude because that's the type of attitude that will lead to everything being just whatever. Just do whatever you want to do. God, come any way you want. Come however you want to. I don't feel like going to church. I'm just I'm going to meddle just a little bit. I don't want to go to church. I'm just going to watch it online. Well, that's okay if it's necessary, but it should never be done out of convenience. If you're able to come to the, body, to the Lord's house for worship, that's what God intended. Never forsake the assembly. So that's just one example. It doesn't mean you don't ever do it. Sometimes sickness, illness, circumstances, work may require that you have to do that. But I'm talking about it just out of convenience. You see, the Bible says we can approach God boldly, but he never says we can approach God casually. There again, he is holy. He takes who he is very seriously, that he is a holy Holy God. And we're to do likewise. As his people, we're called to be holy too. And since he is holy and he takes that very seriously, he also takes our response to him very seriously. And if we start treating God in a casual manner like this dude did and, and ended up paying the, you'd say, the ultimate uh, price, um, we, we have to learn that, that God doesn't accept that. He doesn't accept our casual Christianity. We must come to him with that reverence with that holy, and certainly with obedience. They had been told not to touch it. Now, we may not get struck down, uh, but we could still have Ichabod written on us because of our convenience and just being too casual in the Christian life. And I'm talking about our relationship with God himself. I'm not talking about how you dress uh, and, and those things. I'm talking about in your heart, a casual attitude toward God. Remember, he's not just the man upstairs. God's not someone who says, hey, thank you for getting me out of that, that problem. I'll let you know when I need you again. No, that's, that's, not, that's not how we approach God. We approach God with awe. We approach God with worship, with service, with obedience, with reverence. And so they were not doing that. So they just had this big mess. Everything stopped. The progression to Jerusalem stopped. And uh, they just said, the, David said, we're not going to go any further right now. And so they just stayed there for about three months before they continued their, their journey uh, to Jerusalem. But David was struggling and God was, you know, God was kind of teaching him some things. And in verse 9, it says, and David was afraid of the Lord that day. Well, rightly so. God had acted with a vengeance. He was angry. Uh, and he said, I, he was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, here's a question he asked, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? How can the ark come to me? What's David asking? How can I experience and know the presence of God? I need that ark in my life. 
I need that ark in my relationship. Now, we don't, we don't deal with the ark itself, but we do deal with a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we can be guilty of getting involved in and Ichabod being around us. And so David was saying, how can I know God better? How can I be? I want to experience his presence. I want the ark returned. Uh, well, he went to God and, he, and God showed him and they, they set up a plan. He waited three months and then they proceeded to Jerusalem. Very, very careful. You can read through some of those verses very, very uh, reverently. Uh, they, they approached Jerusalem. They'd stop every six feet and stop and offer, offer and all of those things. And so God uh, allowed them to make it to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem, and you can look over in verse 14, the Bible says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. See, the ark was back. The glory of God had returned to the people of Israel. The presence of God now was represented for the people of Israel. Now, was God ever away from them? Well, if you take Ichabod, seriously, God was ever away from them. He had, to, he had removed his glory from the people of Israel. And that was a serious thing. David realized it because David was a man after God's own heart. He realized that the glory had departed. He realized that Ichabod had been written on Israel during this time. And that's why he went and got it. And that's why he brought it back. And then that's why he celebrated, danced with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod and, and all the house, everybody just shouting. They were having a big party. Celebration because the ark had returned. The glory had been restored to Israel. That all sounds great, but that's still not quite the end of the story. In just a few more minutes. Uh, and I'll finish it. There's one more uh, danger of missing God's glory and it actually happened to David's wife Deborah and so when we pick up in verse uh, 16 here still in chapter 6 so the ark of the Lord came into the city of David Michael and I might David's wife and I might say one of his wives there's a problem right there Michael the daughter of Saul looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. He was, he was worshiping his Lord in the way that he knew how. And look what it says in verse 16, the very last phrase. And she despised him in her heart. She despised him. My friend, contemptible Christianity. When we have contempt for the things of God, the people of God, the men of God, the established holy things that we've already talked about. When we have contempt, it's one thing to treat them casually, the things of God, but now we've taken it a step further. We are, we are treating them with contempt, contempt, with disdain, with anger, and as we'll see in a few minutes, with, with bitterness. So contempt for the things of God, for him, for his people, you got contempt or disdain for a pastor, that's a problem that you need to address because it's going to cause you to miss the glory of God. And we'll see what happens to Michael here in just a second. So one thing we need to learn, when we have contempt for the things of God, for the people of God, the Word of God, that would include the church, contempt for any of those things, we will miss the glory of God because our, our disdain, our bitterness, our anger, our contempt will... Um, Will, will hide us and prevent us from experiencing God's glory and his presence. Just like any unconfessed sin will do that. And so that's what Deborah uh, was, was guilty of. She just, she couldn't even hardly stand to look at him. Well, she and David had a little discussion about the things and David basically said, I'm going to worship my Lord. I will worship him. And that's the attitude we've got to take. But Deborah uh, just dug in her heels even even greater. Uh, and what we learn from her life and what happened to her is, is contempt for the things of God has consequences. There are consequences to how we live, how we respond to God. I said he takes himself and our response to who he is very seriously. Well, he does. And we see that with uh, Deborah as, as an example of some of the consequences. Contempt for the things uh, people of God will, will leave one with bitterness. Just bitterness. Look in verse 22. 
I will make, and this is David actually talking, I will make myself yet more contemptible than this. In other words, he's talking to Deborah, his wife, and I said, you ain't, he basically says, Deborah, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to serve God. Uh, and I'm sorry you don't like it, but that's the way it's going to have to be. I'm, you're going to be even, it's even more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. In other words, you, you're going to hate me. And that bitterness, you, that bitterness swelled up in Deborah. They never returned to a normal relationship as husband and wife. He may very well have sent her away. We don't know for certain, but he may very well have. Uh, and so uh, she was destined for that, that life of, of, of bitterness. But there's one other thing that we see in Deborah's life. You can see it in verse 23. Contempt for the things of God uh, will leave us uh, in a state of barrenness. She was barren. Now, for her, it was literal. Verse 23 says, And Michael, the daughter I had mentioned, I said Deborah a while ago, it's Michael. Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. She was struck literally barren. Now, remember the Bible gives us physical examples, real world examples to teach us spiritual truth. So she was literally struck barren. There were never any more children. Remember for, for ladies in that culture, uh, children was a, a sign or evidence of God's blessing and God's anointing on their lives. And so she, she never had children. She was in a place of bitterness. She was in a place of, of barrenness. She died a lonely person because she had disdain. She had contempt. She practiced contemptible religion for the things of God, for who God is and what he represents and the things that represent him, the holy things, the body of Christ, the church, the people of God. If you have contempt for a brother and sister, my friend, and disdain, bitterness, you need to, you need to get that right. And you need to, first of all, pray, ask God to forgive you but then try to make that relationship right because it's only going to hurt you and you're going to miss the glory just like Michael did. You're going to miss the glory of God. She missed the party. There was a celebration going on and she preferred to stay up and look out her window and just let the bitterness and the anger just continue to rage and grow and fester that it left her in that, that barren nothingness state for the rest of her Life, but she missed it all. She she missed the celebration. She she missed the life that came uh, with that. She missed the joy. Uh, she missed the fruitful of God's fruitfulness of God's blessing on her life. All of those things uh, she missed. Uh, so we need, if we're going to pursue uh, the heart of God, we need to make sure that we don't miss the glory of God. That we see and desire and even pursue knowing and experiencing God's glory in our lives and that's what he wants for us pursue his glory seek after it and certainly don't practice these these three areas of um, convenient christianity casual christianity contemptible christianity but seek after god seek after his glory because he wants that for you now in your, in your group discussion time, you're going to kind of discuss those three areas and, and modern day examples and think through what are ways that we treat God in a convenient way. And when God, remember, we're talking about the things of God. That might be the church. That might be all sorts of things. Our relationships, our service to him are in a casual manner or certainly even worse, in a contemptible manner. God, doesn't want, God does not want you to miss his glory. So pursue him. Seek, practice authentic Christianity in your life. Uh, and he will bless you and it will help you on your journey of pursuing the heart of God. Enjoy your group time together and we'll see you next week. God bless.